There's a story of a gentleman who uh, was losing a lot of weight through exercise and diet and looking after himself. And his work colleagues were very encouraging and proud of him for, the work, for how he had done. And one day he showed up at work and he was carrying with him a really large cake. And they said, uh, so what's this? You're falling off the bandwagon? What's happening here? And he says, you know what? Every day on my way to work, I have to drive by this bakery. And uh, this cake was sitting there and it looked tempting. So I said a quick prayer. And I said, God, if you think I deserve this as a reward, please give me a sign by providing a parking space right in front of this bakery. And he said to them then, on my, only my eighth time around the block, I found a parking spot. Is that a sign from God? We're going to talk a little bit about signs from God today. A special signs from God. And as we're doing this, let me have some lights off here. It feels very dark up here. That's better. Now I can see it. Maybe you can see me. Maybe that's bad. We've been going through Mark chapter 13, which is a, a phenomenal story right at the end of Jesus' life before the crucifixion. He's just gone through a period where he's been debating in the temple about uh, all sorts of things with various leaders and the people of Israel. And as they're leaving the temple for the final time, the disciples say, look at this temple we are walking by. It is a phenomenal structure. And Jesus looks at them and says, do you know what's going to happen? Now one brick of this temple will be standing. And they get to where they're going, Mount of Libya, and they get there and they uh, turn to Jesus and say, so when's this going to happen? And Jesus does not give them a direct answer. He never does. He's going to sort of start answering it in today's work. But um, for the most part, he starts describing some of the things that are to come. He starts telling about things like there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes. Don't panic. That's not the end. That's not the end. Those are shadows of the fact that there is evil out there. They are shadows of what is to come. But just because something goes wrong... Or just because somebody comes along and says, here's Jesus, he's coming now, don't believe him. Don't, don't get suckered into that. Because that's not yet the end. The end is yet to come. And then he starts talking about this great period of suffering, the tribulation that is to come. He talks about God's intervention. God coming along with a great intervention to save the church. That he's not going to abandon the church. Then he talks about judgment that's coming to the world and a great gathering of the people of God. Those from heaven, those still on the earth, gathering them together. Now this week, we conclude this passage where Jesus is starting to tackle a little bit of the question, okay, so people are going to be deceived. People are going to think it's happening when it's not happening. So when will it happen? When will all these events at the end of time really occur? When? Late 19th century, of, particularly in the United States, but it occurred much throughout Christianity, um, there was a movement to try to figure out exactly what is the date. And there was a gentleman who lived, he kind of was born the very tail end of the 1700s, mostly lived in the middle, up to the middle part of the 1800s, by the name William Miller. William Miller uh, mostly became well known for bringing about the, the Seventh day Adventist movement. And in that, he sat down with his Bible and he calculated out the day that Jesus would return. And he initially came out, he said, it's going to be the 21st of March, 1842. 
However, after spending some time, more time was contemplating that, he came back and said, you know what, I think I got it slightly off. April 3rd, 1843. And he built this large temple in the middle of Boston. 3,500 people gathered in that church on April 3rd, 1843, who await the coming of Christ. Didn't happen. Nothing happened that day. So he sat down with his Bible again. And uh, he came to the conclusion, maybe he didn't advertise it well enough. So he came with a new date, April 18th, 1844, just a hair over a year later. He advertised some more. He got more people to come out. Still nothing. He thought, you know what? He sat down with his Bible again and said, I was off by about six months. It's going to be in the fall. But this time, we are going to make sure everybody knows about it. I mean, what he meant by everybody was kind of the United States, because he didn't really have a way to communicate with the world. In those six months, something remarkable occurred. His followers went all through the region and got people really riled up and excited because they figured what they had done wrong was they hadn't got enough people looking for the coming of Christ. They started to publish newspapers. They started to publish magazines. They went everywhere. If church leaders got up and said, you know what, hang on a second, I'm not sure this is right, they would call them sons of Satan. They would call them blasphemers. They would call them all sorts of names until they bullied them to back down. They called them agents of Babylon. The followers, tens of thousands of people, started to follow. And as October of 1844 approached, Jesus had to come back now. Because it was clear that there would be a food shortage if he didn't because fields were left unharvested. People quit their jobs, sold their houses. On instructions from Miller, they got to make sure their debts were paid off. They freely gave away their possessions with no thoughts of repayment. Some went off to mountaintops so that they would be closer so they could be the first to meet Jesus. Others went to cemeteries so that they could be reunited with loved ones. Some even went so far as to dig graves, lie down in them. Because for whatever reason they thought that might be more exciting. William Miller himself started to sell robes, white ascension robes he called them, so that you could look proper on your way to heaven. Tens of thousands of people bought these. Do you know what they needed to do? They needed to read the Gospel of Mark. They needed to read the Gospel of Mark. We do not know when, and we will not know exactly when until after. And I think William Miller misunderstood some of the timelines we found in the gospel. However, his influence has lasted well into the 20th century and that he started a wave of people who predict the dates and we still find them coming out every once in a while and you'll find books and you'll find people occasionally in the news who are making this proclamation. They calculated the dates. And yet... Despite the fact that we're told not to do that, we are told to remain vigilant. To remain vigilant. To remain watchful. As I go through the last part of this passage, I really get two lessons. Number one, do you know what? We should be ready for a world of suffering. We should be world ready for a world of tragedy. We should be ready for a world that opposes our message and continues to reject the love of God because as we're ready and as we're prepared for that, we're not taken aback. And secondly, we are to be prepared for the second coming of Christ because it motivates us to do the work that God has called us to do. Let's talk a little bit about some tender twigs. I'm not going to put the whole first little bit I'm going to talk about on the screen. But basically he says, you know, you can tell when summer's coming by looking 
and a tree. Now we may think spring is here. It certainly felt that way yesterday, didn't it? We can tell by the twig of a fig tree or any plant, really, if summer's coming. And Jesus looks at him and says, well, these things that I'm talking about, they're going to happen before this generation passes away. We'll come to what that means in a second. And he looks at him and says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words never. But when will this happen? Jesus claims ignorance himself. Almost with this daring. So how dare we say that we know exactly when Jesus is going to return? If Jesus says he doesn't know, only our Father in heaven does. We get this odd passage because Jesus says, here are the signs that he's coming. And yet we don't know when it will be. Pay attention to the signs, yet we don't know. How does this work together? It's a really good question. Signs. They show us direction. They point us in the right way. And there is a difference between different signs we see on the highway. You may drive down the highway and you can see a sign that says Edmonton with an arrow that way. And you know that you have to go that way to get to Edmonton. But it doesn't necessarily tell you how long you're until you get there. You might come across another sign that says Edmonton 100 kilometers. Well, you know you got 100 kilometers to drive, but it may not tell you. You may have to turn off along the way. The signs Jesus is talking about are directional signs. They tell us the direction we need to go, but they don't necessarily point out the distance that we have to go. This generation will not pass away. Okay, so he's talking to the disciples. They're long gone. How does that little phrase work? Some of them looked at that and said, well, Jesus' prophecies here are fulfilled in multiple ways. For instance, one of the ways in which the temple is destroyed, which is the beginning of this whole passage, is the destruction of Jesus. Well, that's going to occur in a couple of days. That's certainly fulfilled in the generation of the disciples. Others will look at it and say, well, it's talking about when the Romans come along and literally tear down the temple that stands on the mountain in the center of Jerusalem. They literally do tear it down brick by brick. That occurs in 70 AD, about 40 years after Jesus speaks, not quite 40 years. Some of the disciples have passed away by then, but not all of them. It is within their generation that that occurs. Others look at this passage and say, well, he's talking about sufferings and wars and natural disasters. That occurs in the life of every generation. So that is fulfilled in the life of every generation. Others look at it and say he's talking about the generation of the church. And then one day, Jesus will return before the church is destroyed or taken out in any sort of way. Those are all ways you can interpret this passage into literally saying this generation will not pass away before these things happen. I think they're all right. I think, it's, I think it is a way to understand all of them. It literally, some of these things will occur in the disciples' lifetime. Absolutely, it's fulfilled. In every generation, some of the things that shadow what is to come, that we do have evil, that we do have judgment coming, those things are shadowed in every generation. And before Satan and this world can destroy the church, Jesus will return and it will see its ultimate fulfillment. It's true for all of these things. All are legitimate interpretations. Trouble and struggling and suffering and persecution. All of these things occur in the church era. All of them point to the fact that we live in a world that is not being fully redeemed by the love of God. That there is rejection of the things of God in our world. 
both by people and by spiritual forces. And as long as they are allowed to remain in our presence, there will be conflict. But you know what? Just as much as those things are shadow of evil, the shadow of love is cast over our world as well. Whenever we find good, when we find hope, those are indications that God is still at work. The shadow of good falls over us. We have the shadow of bad, we have the shadow of good, and there's still a struggle that goes on. A couple of years ago, I read a book, and every once in a while I come back to it, it's called The Throne, the Lamb, and the Dragon by Paul Spilsbury, who is actually an Alliance uh, professor who lives in Alberta, he's from Calgary. He wrote in the book of Revelation. I'm going to read a chapter, or not a chapter, I'm going to read a paragraph. I'm not going to make you sit through a whole chapter. Paragraph. Revelation portrays all who follow the Lamb of God as witnesses. Where's martyrs sometimes? As overcomers or conquerors. These are not titles that are restricted to a small elite band of super committed saints. They are Revelation's way of telling us that to be a follower of the Lamb is to share in his victory. Share in his victory by sharing in his witness or even martyrdom. To follow the Lamb is to do what he did and to die as he died. That is not to say that all who identify with Jesus are going to be killed for their faith, or that only those who die for their faith are true followers. Rather, it means that true discipleship requires a life of self-sacrifice, a life that embraces the gospel's fundamental spiritual insight. Life comes through death, and victory comes through defeat. This is what Jesus preached. This is what he practiced in his own life. And we who follow must not expect anything different. Powerful. In other words, there is going to be opposition to God's love. It is even going to come from within inside of us. There are times where God wants to work in my sinful nature does not like what he's doing. That has to go. That has to go. And just like it happens in my life, it happens in our world around us. And sometimes we're going to run into a lot of opposition. But even the fact there's opposition is, is proof that God is still at work. Because what is this world? This world is fighting. What's it fighting? It's fighting God himself. So it's a proof that God is still at work. Will God be defeated? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Heaven. Here it's referring to the skies, not referring to the place where God lives. Space, even. All that in the air. Gonna go. On. Earth, gone. But what God says, nothing can tie. Nothing can touch. Even as the world is destroyed, God's power remains and God's power conquers. And really, this is capturing the whole point of Mark in a little microcosm. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home, puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. I have said throughout this sermon series, we've been almost three years in the Gospel of Mark now. I have said throughout this that the whole point of Mark is that Jesus did not come. Well, it makes a difference. Brees is escaping, but it might be okay. okay. If you're not worried, I'm not going to worry. Okay. Jesus did not come 
to fix all of the world's problems, Jesus came to prepare a church to go out and bring love to the world. That's the whole point of Mark. Tough times are coming. Be ready. There's going to be a fight against suffering. There's going to be a fight against sin. Be on guard. Watch alertly. When it talks about be on guard, keep awake here, it's almost act diligently. The way it's phrased up on, the way that this translation phrase, it almost sounds defensive. Like we should be on the defense against things that are coming against us. It's actually meant to be more offensive. Go up against those things that are going to attack you. Go up against them. Be ready for the fight. Go out and deal with this world. Now the interesting thing, if you read Mark 13 and then you turn and you go to Mark, Matthew chapter 24, you will discover two chapters that are almost word for word identical. There's a couple of extra verses in Matthew that, and some stuff we looked at a couple weeks ago. And it's exactly the same, almost word for word, until we get to this verse. And once we get to this verse, and the next couple of verses, they vary a little bit. They're obviously the same conversation, but each has a slightly different spin than the other. Obviously, when the Gospel writers recorded the words of Jesus, they couldn't record every word. So Matthew and Mark get a lot of the similar stuff, but slightly different spins here. And when we go to Matthew 24, it takes this story of the servant and makes it clear that the servants are given jobs to do. And if the servant does the jobs, when the master returns home and finds them at work, he rewards the servants. But what happens if the servants are being lazy and ignore the master's instructions? <coughs> Master returns with punishment. I was thinking this week about the fact that there have been, I don't know, dozens of TV shows and movies over the years that I have watched personally, which have had the following plot line. Mom and Dad go away somewhere. Teenagers are left at home and given instructions, and what happens? They start a little party, and the party gets out of hand, and mom and dad come home early, unexpectedly. Anybody ever seen a TV show or movie with that as a plot line? I mean, it's, it's repeated over and over again in Hollywood. And people smiling, obviously you've seen them too. That's kind of the idea here. What happens when Jesus returns? What does he find us? Jaden, he's, he's on this side. Jaden, he's over there. He's over there. There you go. All right. Jesus is going to return. What's he going to find us doing? Do you know what? You and I have jobs to do in the kingdom of God to bring the love of God to our world, to bring the love of God to individuals, to help people, to love people, to bring hope. And our jobs have a deadline. The only problem is none of us exactly knows when that deadline is. So maybe we should get to work. I don't know about you, but sometimes I work better with a deadline. I start a to-do list every week of the things I have to do, and some of the things on there are things like, i got to have a sermon ready by the end of the week. But there's always a few things in there that they kind of have more murky deadlines. If I get to them, I get to them this week. Guess which ones get done first? Well, the ones with the deadline are the ones that you have to get done. We have deadlines to bringing the love of God to this world, so we better get to work. And our role is to be the gatekeeper. It's called doorkeeper in this one. But what is a gatekeeper? A gatekeeper is a position of honor and respect and responsibility. It is somebody who has been entrusted with the role of safety and care for a community. 
They are somebody who is to look out for danger, shout out an alarm if danger approaches, and to protect people at great personal risk. That is the role of the church. To protect, to help. It's our role in the Gospel of Mark. Dangers exist, deal with them. Following Jesus is not always safe. We are called to follow him. So watch. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Now obviously this is not literal. You can go to bed. Matthew, again, has a slightly different take on it. He compares it to, the God, to uh, Noah in the book of Genesis. In the book of Noah, or the book of Noah, in the story of Noah, the warning comes, the judgment is coming. Noah's given this job to do. A long period of time passes, and the people all look around and say, so where's this judgment, Noah? I mean, this warning for God came a long time ago, many decades ago, this threat of, of, of God coming with judgment, it's just a story. It's just mythology. It's not true. Look how much time has passed. And then suddenly destruction comes. That's actually a very good illustration. Where's Jesus? We live in the shadow of eternity. We live in the shadow of eternity, whether we're ready for it or not. History is marching somewhere. How long does it take to get there? It doesn't matter. The signs Jesus talks about when there is struggle, when there is suffering, when there is persecution, all those things point to the fact that something's coming. The end is coming. It's like driving down a dark, lonely highway on a winter night, and somewhere off in the distance you can see the light of a town. But it's hard to judge exactly how far away that town is, how long it's going to take to get there. But you can still see the light. It's out there. It's clearly coming. It's coming. It's hard to judge. But we are heading somewhere. And Jesus is preparing them. The crucifixion is about to occur. Disciples, are you ready? For those who follow the disciples, times of difficulty, struggle and suffering, all those things are going to happen. Are you ready? And he says to the entire world, eventually there is judgment coming. There's judgment at the end of all this. Are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> when things go wrong, we are not to see them as unexpected. But we are to know that any sort of suffering we go through in life, any sort of struggle we go through in life, it doesn't matter if it's from some outside source or if it's sickness or whatever, they are all signs that there is a struggle between good and evil in our world. And they are always a reminder, a sign, that something is coming. And do you know what that means? If everything is going right, we're not seeing the signs right. It might be a sign that we're not in God's will. Because there should be opposition to the will of God in this world. Remember I said these signs are direction signs. Are we going the right way? Are we really living in the shadow of eternity? And if nothing ever goes wrong, I'm going to tell you right now, that means God is not at work in our lives. That means we need to do an examination. We need to ask God where we should be. We need to spend concerted time in prayer. Because if everything's going right, that means there's really something going wrong. 
We live in the shadow of evil, and we live in the shadow of an eternal God. And those two things are continually at war. Our world's caught in the middle. We need to be ready for it. Not caught unaware, but ready and at work. Are we ready? Are we ready for the coming kingdom of God that follows suffering? Are we ready for Jesus? I often hear it said that life is short. Let's enjoy it. Do you want? Life is not short. It's eternal. This world is short. It prepares us for the next world. So instead of just having fun, we should make it meaningful. Because that prepares us for the world that is to come. We should be bringing love and joy to a world that desperately wants to live in the shadow of the eternal. Not in the shadow of suffering. We need to turn our attention to a God who is not the God of suffering, who is not the God who is bad, but the God who is holy, the God of love. And we need to focus our eyes on the greatness and the possibilities that exist within Jesus. So let's turn our eyes towards that holy God. I'm going to invite us to join together in song. We're going to sing hymn number two. Holy, holy, holy.